Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, we know the usual New Year's resolutions that people make, but this year, what if instead of tackling things in your personal life, you take a look at your work life, how you can improve it so that everything else can thrive? This week, I've asked career psychologist Sinead Brady to join me to discuss how we can achieve the best work-life balance possible in 2023. I've got my own notebook handy and my pen. I'm going to take lots of notes over the course of the next 20 minutes because I need this advice. Sinead, welcome to the show. How's it going? Really good, Carl, and you? It's going good. Nervous in somewhat because I what you're going to tell us. But I think over Christmas, people do look at life a bit more and they reflect a little bit and think, geez, I'd like to do things a little bit differently next year or change job next year or whatever it may be, or just improve their work-life balance. Because that's kind of what happens at Christmas when you take your foot off the gas. You get to reflect, isn't it? Absolutely. And I love that you mentioned your journal and your pen because there is nothing better, actually, than uh, if that's the one thing that you do kind of at Christmas and you're thinking about work and you're thinking about life and you're thinking about your career. Using your pen and journaling is fabulous because we have activation points in our index finger and our thumb that set both sides of the brain off. And it helps us to trigger these problem solving responses that we don't have during any other form of communication. So, for example, doodling, writing, whatever it is that you want to do. And it doesn't have to be Shakespeare. You just literally get your journal, get your pen and begin to jot down things that are either coming to mind, that are bothering you or that are maybe, you know, across the course of Christmas. And it's amazing when you have, as you say, that free time, you can really begin to pinpoint things that, and you're thinking, OK, so that's something that I'd like to think about. That's something that I might like to, to deal with or that's something that I might like to address. Okay, I'm a total doodler. It's never a really good excuse from people give out to me for doing it. That I'm, I'm, tr I'm triggering my brain to do something very positive here, which is which is great. So, if, you know, work-life balance, it's something that we come across time and time again. People are working probably harder than they ever have. COVID definitely brought that. A longer working day, more stuff going on. Where is the root of the problem? Is it the employee? Is it the person? Is it the fact that we're addicted to what we do? Where is the, the cause of it? So, I guess... For a start, work-life balance in itself is a problem. Um, the notion, because it does suggest that there's some kind of mathematical equation that you can apply to life and to work. And that if you divide your time up in this particular way, then you will be satisfied. And I suppose really, with work-life balance, we have to rethink it fundamentally because the boundaries between work and life have collapsed so enormously that the world of work that we're living and working in now is so different from the world that was set up to think about work-life balance. So when we think about work-life balance, what we're actually thinking about and the way that we need to, to address it is, am I well enough to work? Because work is the ultimate performance, is the ultimate endurance sport. It is something that you want to be able to sustain from the first paid job that you enter into right the way through to retirement and you don't want to do anything today that's going to prevent you from continuing your work for as long as you may wish to work. So we're really talking about being able to sustain your performance over time and there are a couple of things that are vital to that and we don't often think about success and your career but not starting with your career or not starting with your work and when I work with organisations or when I work with individuals I absolutely there are th there's one pillar that you have to start with and that is your physical non-negotiables so when you were thinking about work-life balance kind of scratch that notion as such and begin to think about am i well enough to work today tomorrow and for the remainder of my career and how can i ensure that i'm actually well enough to perform and What's really intriguing about that is then you begin to think about the basics of life. So I refer to these kind of as nest. Um, are you nourishing your body? Are you exercising? And I don't mean kind of, you know, are you running ultra marathons and whatever else, you know, that sometimes Instagram would make you believe is important. Um, I mean, are you just moving? Um, and then are you sleeping well? And are you spending time with people who make you smile, including quality time with yourself? And when you talk to somebody who's a psychologist, uh, you might expect that. When you talk to somebody who is a psychologist who specialises in the workplace and careers, you may not expect to hear that as being the pillars of a successful work life and career. But they fundamentally are. They're the basics of wellness for all performance and in particular your career. 
So are you nest? Just think about nest and the comfort of Christmas and think about, are you nourishing yourself? Like, are you getting up from the desk to eat? Are you going outside to see what the weather is like outside? Um, are you sleeping well? And are you spending time with people who make you smile? That's the pillars of work-life balance. They're the pillars of a well-lived career. Uh, you, your angle of work as an endurance event, I love that. But that, in all fairness, it's a, it's a very different spin on how we view work because it is, it's a lifelong endurance event up until when you retire. So that, that changes the, the whole profile of how you view what you do. Absolutely. And there's nobody in this wild world, even those of us, and I love exercise and it doesn't matter what you love. It's it's a bit like what Oscar Wilde said, everything in moderation, including moderation. Um, so it's when you're looking at work, you're thinking about, you know, how can I sustain this across the course of my career so I don't end up sick or unwell or burnt out because and it's just it's an injury. That's an injury because of what you're doing in work. So how can you make sure that your work today is not preventing you, your work style today is not preventing you from working into the future. And working well is about um, sleeping, eating, moving and spending time with people who make you smile, including yourself. What if someone says to you, and I'm, and I'm thinking of, I have lots of friends who are GPs and, I, and I'm thinking of them actually in this scenario because they're all working so hard and they're all r the r yeah. rural GPs. Then they come back and say, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm working too hard. I got home at 10 o'clock or whatever. And I just, yeah. you know, they're in that kind of cycle of eat, of, you know, go to work, struggle through the day. If they get a lunch break, they're doing well. They get home at 10 o'clock and they, they run this for four or five days during the week. Yeah, I, I really have to say for the people that work in our health service, I really feel for them because the hours that they are conditioned to work are just... It's, it's not right and there's a shortage and, and that's a whole other conversation, I think. So I don't think that any sector in our economy should be based on the fact that people have to work the length of hours that we are expecting of our healthcare professionals and expect them to do the best job for every person that walks in the door. So I really feel for, for anybody who's in a scenario or a situation where the environment or the culture within which they work expects overwork and actually privileges it and normalises it, normalizes it as something of a badge of honour to wear. And I think that's really something that we have to address because that level, like we know that burnout hits at around 45 hours per week. And that's a combination of paid and unpaid work, not just paid work. So paid work is the job that you go to do in the office or in your local shop or wherever you do your job. But there's also unpaid work that we do, and that's the housework and all of the different things that happens to make a home function. That's also work. And your brain and your body doesn't differentiate between paid and unpaid work. Your body is just active and going all of the time. So um, anybody or any profession that demands more than 45 hours of work per week um, as an expectation, as a bottom line. We really have to look at that. Um, and I would say to people, if you are thinking about resetting boundaries, if you are thinking about, you know, how can I do better? Look at the big picture and kind of go, you know, by June, I would like to, you know, finish work every evening at six. And then one small step at a time think how can I peel 15 minutes off every day this week and then how can I take another and then layer by layer reduce because you're not going to feel comfortable you know we talk about quiet quitting and all of these different things in the workplace but the reality is that many people that are in jobs that involve care and involve you know a sense of emotional connection to other people quiet quitting is just not an option um but it's about slowly piece by piece regaining a little bit of control so 15 minutes every day for a week followed by another 15 minutes the following week by June the next thing is you're actually finishing at a time that feels reasonable to you and you've regained some of the control and then delegate where you can um, and I know in some instances it's not possible to delegate but you know it's wonderful to have a sense of you know we can get our food delivered <laughs> there's all of these different things and I know I was going to stop getting my food delivered because I didn't like the way my fruit came and then I was like well that's just throw the baby out with the bath water let's let's get the food delivered and I can go down to my local shop there's a brilliant vegetable guy that comes to our town every Tuesday and Saturday and I just go to him and I pick up my own vegetables and my own fruit so you know buy time where you can um but it is what's the smallest thing that I can do today to improve on tomorrow 
it sounds just from chatting to you that it's very much like goals you know it's like goal setting for a marathon or whatever it, and and, and the, you view work a very similar way which is you step back you analyze you say where do i want to take this to over the course of whatever and then work back in small manageable chunks to get to that point where that's the work style that you want absolutely and it is about small manageable bite-sized chunks because you know, you can think big, but act small. And I think that's the thing with Christmas. You know, so often when we think, we set this New Year's resolution and we decide, well, this is what I'm going to do. And then suddenly you want to do it all. And then when you only do a little bit of it, we give up because, you know, we focus on an event or we focus on doing everything all at once. But where we focus on an event and we say, well, when I achieve that, I will be successful or whatever suddenly you might find yourself back at square one very, very quickly. Um, so what you're doing is you're kind of going, no, this is actually a process. This is cyclical. When I get to June, I'm going to focus on something else. And maybe I'm going to integrate in one other small thing to my 15 minutes and I'm going to replace it with doing something else because I'd love to get out for a walk. So let's start walking and then let's move to, to doing a little bit of, or I'm going to once a week, I'm going to ring somebody that I haven't been speaking to for a very, very long time. Or I'm thinking about pivoting out of the role that I'm in into an allied um, profession or into another profession or changing altogether. So I'm going to start to network and I'm going to network once a week by having a call or having a coffee with somebody virtually or in person and just begin to think about how this is cyclical. Change is the new permanent. It's ongoing. It's continuous. And how can I become a friend of change and do it in a way that works for me during this season of my life? A friend of change. I like that. It's good. Folks, you're yeah. listening to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Lay Healthcare. This is a fascinating chat. I'm making lots of me mental and physical notes as we're chatting to Sinead all about careers. So presumably, create, you mentioned it at the start of the interview, and I meant to come back to it, that, that idea of the non-negotiables, yeah. that finding your non-negotiables and sticking to them more importantly. They're like New Year's resolutions. People make them and then don't stick to them. But presumably finding them and sticking to them is a really crucial a part of kind of improving not just your work-life balance but your own kind of enjoyment from the work that you do yeah 100 percent. so your non-negotiables work in three um different segments and it's just helpful to help you work out your non-negotiables so that baseline is your physical non-negotiables that i spoke about that's nest that's your nourishment your exercise your sleep and your time with people who make you smile your next layer is your um personal non-negotiables and that becomes a little bit less you know strict and it's kind of like okay so for me what are my non-negotiables what do i need to earn per year my financial security and stability because let's be honest that's everybody has to put a roof over their head and pay bills and so on and then you're looking and you're going, well, what's my work pattern like? You know, what are my non-negotiables around that? Do I want hybrid? Do I want remote? Do I want to be flexible? What does that look like for me and my, you know, whoever is in your circle during this particular season of my life? Do I have a certain hobby or interest that I really want to focus on? And they're your personal non-negotiables and they're the second layer of your non-negotiables. And then your third and final layer of your non-negotiables is your professional non-negotiables. And you're looking at them and you're kind of thinking, okay, so... During this particular season of my life, whatever that season it is, and it might be a season of parenting, it might be a season of caring, it might be a season of when you're involved and you don't have any of those responsibilities. So you're, you know, you've different things happening in your life and you're thinking, OK, so during this particular season of my life, my professional non-negotiable is to get experience in this area. Or my professional non-negotiable is to, it depends on whether you're working from a skills model or a deficit model. So, sorry, a strengths model or a deficit model. So some people will say, you know, I really want to build this skill because it's a weakness of mine or it's a challenge of mine. And other people will say, you know what, I'm just going to accept the fact that I have these weaknesses or these challenges in my skill set and I'm going to focus on building my strengths. So it depends on the model that you're working from, what your pers professional non-negotiables might look like. I always say to people, you know, it's fine and well building your your areas of challenge and there's an element of that with everything. But there comes to a point in your career where you're saying, actually, I'm OK with not being brilliant at all of these things. I'm deciding to really focus on building this skill because this skill is important to me as I progress in my career as I, or as I decide to make a change in my career. So what are your professional non-negotiables? And sometimes we're led to believe that we should be always um, doing more, being more, upskilling, reskilling, retraining, micro courses. My, and, and that is fine. But have a particular 
plan in place for that and rather than just willy nilly doing things for the sake of doing them do something because it brings you a sense of engagement because it brings you a sense of joy and that could be learning to knit that could be learning to you know um it's really fascinating um one of the the most complex um mathematical equations was solved by a woman who was crocheting and um, she was a mathematician and she was crocheting and she realized that the pattern that she was crocheting was actually a model for the um mathematical equation she was trying to solve so it was actually through indulging in her hobby in something that was stretching her that she solved a really really big professional problem so you know, your personal, your professional non-negotiable might be, I want to learn, I want to grow. That doesn't have to be always aimed at your career. Um, because our career is not all of who we are, it is part of who we are. Um, and I think that might help a little bit as well when we separate. And if we're finding the struggle, the struggle with work-life balance, it's to separate yourself from your career and go, okay, so that is part of who I am. The other part of who I am is my my own personal, you know, self. It's my relationships with people. It's my relationship with myself. I have two big questions for you, I think. The, the first okay. is, what do people say to their managers? So say they're listening into this chat, they think, okay, yeah. maybe I am burnt out, maybe I am overworked and or whatever. Or, you know, I want to get home an hour earlier in the evening by June, as we were chatting about earlier on. How, where do they go with that? How do you, how do you approach it with a manager or with a boss and say, look, you know, people are often afraid of almost like a conflict scenario where they're afraid yeah. to go to the boss and say, look, I actually can't work any harder or I can't do five courses this year or whatever they can't do. Yeah. How, how, do how do you broach that? So I think there's a couple of things in that question and it's a really big question. But I think sometimes if you're working in an organisation or for an organisation whereby the expectation is that you should always be on, you have to ask yourself if you're no longer feeling comfortable with that type of an environment, the likelihood is that you on your own are not going to change that environment. So you have to ask yourself, is this the right environment for me to be in? And if it's not, that's actually OK. Um, so you might be kind of looking at it and going, well, by June, I know that in my current organisation, that's not possible for me to do this. So instead of, you know, you're actually going to be putting in place an exit strategy and you're going to think, OK, so between now and June, I'm building an exit strategy so that by June, I've everything in place so that when I'm ready to make the change, I can make the change or I can have the conversation in June and I can say, I really need this for, ha if this is going to work for both of us so that I can be my best self at work, I need to be able to do this. And if you really don't think that that's possible, I would be looking at an exit strategy because changing culture is one of the most challenging things that you can possibly do, even if the organisation wants to. But if you look up and beyond where you are in the organisation and you look around yourself and everybody in that organisation works late, stays late, does the courses and works on the weekends, the chances are you're not in an environment where that's going to be heard with open ears. Great answer. I love it. Okay, great. And then, okay, the workaholics who are listening in, and I put myself in the workaholic category. I tend to work a lot. What do you say to them then? And I get the nest thing. I get, I get that, right? So I, I you know, I mind, I, I totally get that. Uh, for people listening in who are who are married to their jobs, for one for a better word, who are those workaholics? What what conversation you have with clients like that when you see them? Yeah. So we come back to meaning. Um, so we're looking at you know what is your when you think about your job or your career, what is what is the meaning, the intrinsic meaning of that? And what do you want your impact to be? And and then it's to look and to say, is this about quantity or is it about quality? Um, so let's look at could your quality actually be improved by one or two percent and the quantity reduced by one or two percent, but you decrease your capacity to increase your capability. So it's really looking at it and saying, how can we start to take things back so that you can actually be and perform at your best self? And, and you know the research in your field um, and every single piece of research is telling us that when you take breaks, you are better at your work. Your performance improves, your capacity is decreased, but your capability increases. So I would suggest to the workaholics like yourself, perhaps out there, Carl, um, to begin to take breaks during your your day. So these are micro breaks, um, moments whereby you physically get up after doing maybe 90 minutes of work or a stretch, set your alarm on your phone, you get up and you move even if you don't want to. You integrate those moments into your day. 
Um, and then across the course of time, you begin to put a structure around focused work where you're really getting in and you've got a core focus and you're getting stuff done. And really anybody is only capable of four hours of that per day. The human brain can't function any more than four hours focused work per day. And that's where the whole notion of the, the four hour work week comes from. Um, but the evidence is that your brain will only function at capacity for four hours maximum. But you need to be taking breaks about every 90 minutes in order to, 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 to be able to kind of go back in and perform at a heightened level again. So to the workaholics out there, I would say, ask yourself the question, what is the function of your working to the level that you're working? What do you want your impact to be? And then ask yourself, would you like to increase your performance and your capability while um, making, you know, increase those things for yourself, but at the same time, reducing your capacity? Um, and that can be a really meaningful way to have um, very strong conversations around how to give yourself the permission to actually break up with your work a little bit. Therapy, it's fantastic, it's great. Okay, so my, my final question is this, uh, three takeaways. We, we often ask guests who come on for their three takeaways they would like listeners to take away from the conversation that you and I, that we've had. What, are your, what, what would you like our listeners to take away from it? So I'd love people to take away the notion of work-life balance in itself is flawed. Um, and it's to think about working well so that you can be well in the rest of your life. Um, so it's not about thriving in your career or your life. It's about being able to do both. You shouldn't have to choose. Um, and I, I'd love for people to really take that away. Secondly, um, the pillars of success in your career are based on your physical well-being and they are your physical non-negotiables your personal non-negotiables and then your professional non-negotiables and then in the third instance it's like you know work if it is a source of enjoyment that's great but if it is something that is really painful for you if it's not a source of enjoyment ask and look reach out for help from somebody um, so that you can actually find a way to have and extract meaning from your work because it should be a source of contentment 80 percent of the time it's nothing is you know, picture perfect. You're not going to love everything every moment that you do it. Um, and then figure out ways, you know, small, think big, act small. That might be four, Carl. <laughs> four is perfectly fine. You've got so much content to give. It's great. We'll happily, <laughs> we'll happily take four. It's fantastic. I know you have a book coming out fairly soon. Uh, and if people want to find you on Instagram and stuff, where can they find you? So the best place to find me is on Instagram at the career psychologist. Um, so career psychologist and um, Sinead Brady. And my platform outside of that is um, A Career to Love. So my book is launching on the 30th of March. And I have a journal um, that's coming out in the new year as well that actually takes people through these steps um, in terms of um, how you can write and work your way through a lot of these things that we're talking about now. Great, Sinead, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to catch up and the very best of luck with the book and with You're the so journal. Welcome. Folks, that is it for another Thanks, episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. A fascinating insight into work-life balance today. I really hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to rate and review and you know where we, where we are, realhealth at independent.ie at Carl Henry PT on Instagram. We'll see you next week for more Real Health. It's long before. Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.